I should, I should wait till the end before you applaud. You might not, it might be terrible. Um, thank you, Scott. <laughs> we spent way too much time together. Um, the title, I kept the title kind of vague. Um, <clears throat> actually, someone thought it was a typo, but it's not a typo. It's supposed to be repeated, and I hope by the end of the talk it will be a little bit more clear uh, why the title is what it is. Um, I, I know a few of you, but I don't know many of you, so I always feel the sort of the need to justify why a pale Englishman, Scotsman, originally um, is talking to you about U.S. territories, let alone U.S. coral reefs. Um, I actually belong here, where we don't have sun, which is nice. <laughs> Uh, this is a really good day in Oxfordshire in the UK. Uh, but my buddy and I growing up were keen uh, scuba divers. And hopefully Diana isn't here, but we, we taught ourselves to scuba dive in the quarries. Uh, a few emergency ascents in dry suits, but apart from that, we did okay. And when I finished high school, I, I, I was determined that I wasn't interested in education and I wanted to pursue a career in diving. And I worked my way around the South Pacific, just kind of uh, jumping from job to job, doing some tourist dive guiding and that kind of stuff. But it gave me a little bit of a taste for what it was like to work on coral reefs. This was the first time I'd actually been exposed to coral reefs. And I, and I found it a f fascinating environment. I, so I returned to the UK with this uh, new drive and enrolled in a bachelor's of marine biology. And I got to live at this little island in between uh, England and Ireland for a while called the Isle of Man. And got to play at being a marine biologist, which was really great. And we, we got out, we were able to take boats out this is actually the first digital photo photograph I ever took here of a basking shark. The camera back then, you could only take eight shots and then it was full, so it really dates it. Uh, I then, I've never been one to sort of rush things. Uh, I finished my bachelor's and I went traveling again, working. I uh, did a little bit of work in Tonga. I managed to land a nice job uh, at Auckland University in New Zealand working as a research diver. Uh, essentially, I was being paid to take, uh, help master's students and PhD students setting up their experiments, um, you know, being, trying to keep logistics safe, that kind of stuff. A really great experience and taught me a lot about experimental ecology and observational ecology and really inspired me to actually continue my education. And I uh, returned to the UK and I sort of managed to convince the people in New Zealand if I went away and learned a bit more and, and took some classes, could I then come back and do my research? And they said yes. So my buddy and I that I grew up with diving came back out to this beautiful spot. It's a, one of the oldest marine reserves in the northeast coast of New Zealand. And you can shore dive. We had a little boat and we did a project looking at uh, within the kelp itself uh, trying to build predictive models looking at fish assemblages in different reef habitats. Uh, essentially, it was just a good excuse to go dive in a really pretty place and take lots of photographs. And we were forced to write it up, which was good. Uh, it gave me a little bit of a kickstart. And while I was in New Zealand, uh, I saw, I became really good friends with a, a lady called Professor Marty Anderson, who's probably one of the best multivariate statisticians in the world, I think. Uh, she taught me a lot, and we wrote a PhD proposal together, which got funded uh, to then expand this predictive modeling all across the northeast coast of New Zealand out onto the, some of the outer islands, the Poor Knights Islands, which if any of you have been to, are probably some of the nicest kelp diving I've ever done in my life. 60 meter visibility, incredible. Um, but at the same time that we were applying for this, I, there was a call for a fully funded project, which is really unusual in New Zealand. And this was the title, Coral Disease Biology at Palmyra Atoll, Central Pacific. And being the, you know, the compulsive diver, I googled Palmyra Atoll and saw this, and then I was kind of torn, because although predictive modeling of fish assemblages in New Zealand in the winter would have been really, really fun, this did in look intriguing. Um, so I applied, you had to, it was like pop idol, you had to go through a various rounds, and I got through to the final three, did something right, uh, and they offered me the, the position. Uh, the only condition I asked was that we remove biology, I didn't consider myself a biologist, and asked if we could replace it with the word ecology instead, and that was agreed upon. But other than that, there wasn't really much restriction on the project. This is what Palmyra Atoll looks like underwater. This is where Scott and I first met. Great. Uh, I still remember that day. This is honestly, this isn't like, I haven't just picked this photograph from, this is pretty typical of the shallow reef environment at Palmyra. It's incredible visibility. Uh, what I find really interesting for the Central Pacific is a huge diversity of sclerotinian hard coral species. Uh, between Palmyra and its neighboring uh, Atoll Reef Kingman, they actually have the highest levels of coral diversity in the Central Pacific, which is interesting. There's an array of fish species, and the really key thing about Palmyra is that these charismatic megafauna. And in particular, when I went diving at Palmyra, for in the first week uh, of diving at Palmyra, and this is true, I saw not only more sharks, but also more species of sharks than I'd ever seen in my entire diving career in the South Pacific, just hands down. It was incredible. And these are pretty frequent, these big gray reefs as well as white tips. These are a little bit more rare, although actually Scott was actually right next to me when, that, when we got that shot, and I'm pretty sure you flinched when he turned. <laughs> You were probably with your camera. Uh, 
So the point here is that we went out to Palmyra to learn about how functionally intact reefs can operate, and my role was to try and get established baselines for coral disease, and as well uh, as working on some other projects. And to sort of sum up, because I'm not really going to talk much about my PhD work today, um, it results in a, a series of publications that all sort of have something in common if, if you scan across them. It's either involves quantitative ecology or some form of predictive modeling. Uh, my focus was on bleaching and, and, and coral disease at Palmyra, but I got involved with some collaborative projects looking at large-scale patterns across the Pacific, which is what I was really interested in. And this kind of uh, led to something else, which was a, a, a donor trip out to Palmyra, or a research trip with Scott, tanned, and this chap, Stuart Sandin, who's now my boss. And uh, Stuart and I realized we had really similar interests. And as Stuart does, because he's very blase, he kind of said, do you want to come and work for me when you, when you finished? And I was like, yeah, sure, it was over, over some beers. Uh, I, I explained to him I didn't need it in writing, because I need a visa. I can't just show up in America, you know? <laughs> so we did that, and that was my transition to Scripps. And ever since then, this was kind of the, the, the challenged question that he put to me. And this was a project that he had funded at the time between Scripps and NOAA uh, as a Cameo-funded project through NSF to uh, work up existing data that NOAA had in the Central Pacific. And the specific question that really excited me, it's, it's a hard question, though. What is the relative effect of local human impacts versus global climatic forcings on coral reef community organization and resilience? So nothing too tricky to achieve in a year, but you know, we thought we'd give it a go. So the talk today, I, I kind of want to talk, this was a, a project that went on for about a year. Um, and we're now starting to write up the manuscripts. It, it took a lot of data organization. I want to tell you a little bit of a story about the data uh, in two parts. Uh, a sort of snapshot view of some uh, spatial modeling and some temporal patterns and modeling. There's not going to be any equations in this whole talk, so I'm going to try and get this through for you without a single equation, because I know people fall asleep. This part I really want to get onto, but we'll see how much time we have at the end. And if this is a new project we've just started, and I think it, you'll find it really interesting. OK, so part one. Um, looking at the drivers of benthic community organization across the US Pacific. I want to just, um, just recap on a couple of things, as I know not all of you, if any, uh, are that familiar with coral reef ecology. But there's, you know, it's been termed that we're now in this new geological era, which is, uh, some ecologists have termed the Anthropocene, where humans have had such an impact on the planet, we've actually changed how the planet functions. It's that noticeable. It's debated whether that, it's not a true geological term, but it's, it's been used quite a lot recently. And on coral reefs, one pattern we're seeing, and this is, this is global, is this shift from things that build coral reefs, i.e. hard corals and clusters chlorine and algae, to a shift to communities that don't build corals, that, that don't build reefs, excuse me, that are, are non-accreting reefs, and that are dominated by fleshy organisms, organisms such as perhaps sponges or, or um, coralomorphs. And this is a global phenomenon we're seeing in both the Caribbean, and actually have lost a lot of the Caribbean reefs, and is now showing up in the Indo-Pacific. When we think about resilience of a system, just to touch on that really briefly then, so we're thinking about this global decline of coral reefs. I, I do actually just want to quote um, Holling at this point. Resilience is broadly defined as the capacity of a system to absorb disturbances and reorganize while undergoing change, so as to still retain essentially the same function, structure, identity, and feedbacks. So if you like, it's this ability of a system or an ecosystem to bounce back up from perturbation and still function. Terry Hughes summarizes it quite nice conceptually uh, recently in a tree paper whereby you can have two different systems that they define on a coral reef. So two different attractors, if you like, in modeling speak. You have a coral-dominated system versus a macroalgae, the fleshy organism-dominated system, with the ecosystem state being sort of good down to bad. On the x-axis here, we have human pressure, so overfishing, nutrients, or global climate change ranging from low to high. And the point here is that we want to be up here in this state, okay, for reefs to keep growing. And that reefs in a healthy ecosystem state will actually take a fair level of, of perturbation until there's a tipping point and they suddenly drop toward this other attraction to this other ecosystem state. The key thing here is to return back to your previous state, you actually have to, have to traverse the x-axis much further back. So you have to relieve that pressure far more than the tipping point in the first place. And this is known as hysteresis. Here he's basically showing that in a coral-dominated healthy state with low human impact, the perturbations can be very large, and it will still return to that same coral-dominated attractor. If you cross this dotted line, you then shift between the alternative attractor. So that should hopefully give you an idea of what we're sort of asking today. Why do some coral reefs remain in this state, and others shift towards this state? And what are these things here, these perturbations, and how much do they affect the state change of these reefs? That's what we were trying to answer. There was sort of a call to arms in 2003 and 2004, and there was a big uh, review in science. Terry Hughes and, and, and John Pandolfi and others, David Bellwood, put together a series of papers highlighting the regional loss of, of coral reefs, both in the Caribbean and the Indo-Pacific. And 
they were basically highlighting that we've seen this almost complete destruction of reefs in Jamaica, and we're starting to see these patterns occur in the Indo-Pacific. We really need to do something. We don't want to just sit back and watch the Indo-Pacific decline. We should be learning from our mistakes, pulling from Jared Diamond, perhaps. In 2010, they uh, presumably a lot of negativity was put out in terms of papers of reefs going, going away, and Terry Hughes then published a really inspirational paper in Tree, uh, Rising to the Challenge of Sustaining Coral Reef Resilience. And he basically summarized it by saying, instead of just observing and documenting how reefs die extremely well, even quantitatively rigorously, perhaps we should be thinking about what is driving those changes and can we do anything about them. And even at the Coral Re International Coral Reef Symposium uh, last year, there was a call uh, during one of the plenaries for regional scale analyses of comparable data to determine the factors governing reef resilience. And the key thing here is this question is extremely hard to answer because the data you need to answer this question are, inc are incredibly hard to come by. We can't create manipulative conditions. We can't move people, what we used to be able to in the shade, we're not allowed to anymore, it's unethical, <laughs> right? You can't just shift people around and, ex and, and sort of set up these experiments across the Pacific. We have to embrace natural variability that exists. And we can do that in terms of natural experiments, but we have to understand there's a lot of variability and we have to factor in all that variability into our understanding. What we want to do is start looking for gradients, essentially. One thing that seems common, though, in all these summaries is that uh, because we're in the Anthropocene, a lot of, of work is focused on the effects of human activity, so local human impacts such as overfishing, local nutrient pollution, and global climate change on reef dynamics. And I do feel, actually, recently we've lost a little bit of appreciation for natural variability, and natural variability arising from natural gradation, uh, gradients in climate, such as wave activity, temperature, and ocean productivity. And if you've been lucky enough to traverse a lot of these uh, gradients in human uh, impacts and oceanic conditions, you start to see that not all reefs are the same. Even if they're experiencing human impacts, they differ. Why do they differ? Well, fortunately, this Cameo project put us in contact with the Coral Reef Ecosystem Division of NOAA, uh, who Emily and uh, BZ, BZ stand up for a moment. I want to introduce Brian. Brian Zaglinski here is a senior uh, PhD student in our lab and actually worked for CRED for 10 years. And so a lot of data I'm presenting today, he actually was, uh, had a hand in collecting. And so it's very useful to have him around because you understand the caveats in the data. And he almost knows everything about every single island in the Pacific. When, when, you, when you're an analyst and you work with other people's data, and I don't mean this rudely, but it's a bit like wearing other people's underwear. Okay, you need to, you need to really get to know them before you're willing to do it. And it's the same with data. You need to get into the data and understand what's wrong with the data to understand what the patterns truly are. There's a lot of caveats, would you agree? And part of that is filtering the data and understanding it properly. CRED collect data in four main archipelagos, the Mariana Islands, the Hawaiian Archipelago, American Samoa, and then what's called the Pacific Remote Island Areas, these groups of uh, uninhabited, uh, sparse uh, ocean atolls and islands. Human gradients range from the populated islands in the South Marianas to no humans up top. Same in the Hawaiian archipelago. The northwestern Hawaiian island is a monument and there's no humans living there, so they're completely unpopulated. The Prias, as I said, Pacific Remote Island areas are all unpopulated. And American Samoa is kind of split between some islands with people, some islands without people. You can see here we're starting to get a nice natural experiment to start asking this question of different levels of human impact, at least. One of the data methods that uh, NOAA collect are to what's called towed diver surveys. And this is where a diver is towed behind a boat about a speed of a, a 1.5 knots. Uh, and they're actually collecting data as they, as they go along about the benthic environment, how much coral is there, how much crustose coralline algae. The incredible thing about this technique, what you lose in, in taxonomic resolution, you gain spatial coverage. And this is Palmyra Atoll, where I did my PhD. And this is the track that the towed divers made in two to three days at Palmyra. They actually covered almost 54 linear kilometers of reef area on the forage, which is incredible. So if we're thinking about how we want to get a characteristic view of what an, an island looks like, this is really the right kind of data we want to be using. We can summarize this in a snapshot. So just pool all that data, average across it, and get an idea of what these islands look like at a mean level across these different environments. So we have those four archipelagos I spoke about just now. And then on the x-axis, or the y-axis, excuse me, we have a percentage cover of hard coral. And you can see here the variation both uh, between archipelagos, but also within archipelagos. The gray here indicates those that are uninhabited, no people, while the whiter populated islands. And you can see here, there's sometimes a little bit of a trend. You may think that, okay, maybe the Priyas are particularly high coral cover, they don't have people, but on the whole, it, it's kind of noisy. And that's sort of the point. When you look at CCA, there's a little bit more of a trend towards this increase with decreased latitude towards the equator, but again, there's a lot of noise. And the same for fleshy uh, macroalgae. So what's driving this variation? That's the question. 
If we look at just trying to characterize at a very coarse level, these are some uh, bootstrap frequency distribution estimates. Uh, basically, all you need to understand from this is that these are sort of distribution curves for each benthic category. And I split it up by remote islands, so no people, and populated islands. And something comes out of this coarse sort of one factor type definition where you see slightly higher coral cover at the remote islands. CCA is almost overlapping. There's a, there's a, there's a slight difference suggested here, but the actual bootstrap dis distributions overlap enough to there to, the, to be no significant difference. Okay, so splitting up into this binary view doesn't seem to capture what's going on. We could break it up further. We can uh, do the same thing, but within each archipelago, we can break it out by those islands that are populated and remote. And we see this kind of thing that's, again, reasonably hard to interpret. We see some commonalities. The, un the remote parts of American Samoa have high levels of CCA, perhaps. Again, there's a lot of overlap and noise. And so the point here is if you take this a step further and just do a, a simple sort of two-way and over approach to this kind of data, um, the patterns appear, for me, I think they're too complex to explain. Uh, you see the sign significant interaction between island status, so remote versus populated, and archipelago. There's more variation than can be explained in this simple factor design. And that's what's interesting about this. That's why I think it's fun. Uh, this got us thinking, what else is varying across all these islands? It's not just humans. It's, a, it's the natural climate is also varying. And we know that natural climate and anomalies in climate have a huge influence on coral reefs. We know this from, from decades of work. We know that increases in sea surface temperature, while having a positive effect such as increased metabolism for reef organisms, if they go above some kind of climatological mean, can cause a stressful event and lead to coral bleaching, where the corals lose their zooxanthellae and can lead to loss of coral cover, and even disease outbreaks. Irradiance acts as a light source, so it feeds corals who have symbiotic algae. It feeds algae, obviously, because they photosynthesize. Uh, again, stressful events can lead to coral bleaching. Waves supply particulate matter. They create flow and oxygen recirculation. They supply particles from the deep. Uh, but huge wave events can also cause physical destruction. So there's that kind of positive and negative. And ocean productivity, we know that uh, in oligotrophic waters, such as the remote Pacific, uh, increased productivity often supplies food for corals and algae. And new work that's just come out has shown this actually provides us a buffering against other stressful events. So if there's a big temperature thrust, the, the corals start to bleach. If there's a, an upwelling event or an increase in productivity just after that, it may buffer them against that stress and allows them to regain their, um, their, their energy. Okay. We think that climate may have something going on across these islands, but then we were faced with another challenge. These islands are remote, that we don't necessarily have instruments to measure the oceanography and climate at all these islands. We're faced with another challenge, and that's to summarize the climate of each of these islands. And I work with a, a chap, Jamie Gove, who's also based at the NOAA division in Hawaii, who's an oceanographer and a really good uh, oceanographer remote sensing guy. And we basically came up with taking these four metrics, so sea surface temperature, waves, chlorophyll A as a proxy for productivity, and irradiant stress, and what he did was he found a, a very clever way to use satellite-derived data and filter it uh, to properly characterize what's going on at each of these islands. Now, as he taught me, if you just download sort of NOAA data from the website and plug and play, as I would have, it's full of, of caveats, right? It's dirty. And you come out with the wrong interpretation of the data. He's cleaned the data up really nicely with some collaborators and calculated the black bars here are the climatological ranges of each of these conditions across all our islands again. And these other bars, which I won't go into detail, are the frequency of anomalous events. So anomalous events that are context specific, how often those temperatures actually rise above that upper climatological limit. And we do that and we also calculate the anomaly magnitudes, the magnitude of those anomalous events as well. And through this he was able to give me a data set that uh, kind of starts to characterize the oceanic and climatic conditions across our different gradients. So now we have humans and climate fairly well uh, captured we believe. The thing you can do then of course is to create a basic model. We have our response variable which are our changing benthic conditions across all our islands. And we have our set of predictors. In this case, uh, these four climate variables, each with their long-term mean, the frequency of anomalies, and the anomaly magnitudes. So that's 12 predictors. The 13th comes from that binary categorical predictor of people, no people. Very simple uh, spatial model. Snapshot view of the reef, 2008, 2009 data. Taking all the data we have in, in the past history of these islands, start reconstructing what may explain some of the variation we're seeing in benthic patterns. When you create uh, simple linear models looking at this stuff, what becomes clear, uh, I won't go into this in detail, but if you hear we have our three response variables, our benthic types. We have those uh, variables that form the optimal model, so a balance between predictive performance but also parsimony. And we have here an interesting tale where we're just using these few metrics. I, I was actually quite surprised by this, and this sort of categorical variable of people know people. We're explaining a large amount of variability in these benthic types across these islands. This is using islands as replicates, so the power is in 
I feel very strong here. We're actually using each point on that regression plot is an entire island. It's not multiple sites around a single island. We're really traversing these gradients. The interesting thing, I think, also is that island status, i.e. people, no people, really only came through for the coral signal here. Um, and lastly, which I want to go into a little bit now, are the different effects of these different uh, climate variables on these benthic patterns. Because what, this isn't at, at all interesting, I don't think. This is just a table of numbers. Who cares? Right? What's interesting are the relationships. And when you start looking at these in more detail, I'm not, by the way, advocating that you do a model fitting approach and then resort to univariate regression analyses. Don't do that. It's really bad form. These just came up. I didn't have time to remove them. The point here is that we have coral cover on the y-axis. Remember, if you look, think back to our model, wave energy came out as a very important explanatory variable. And we see at remote islands in the dotted line, because we have that interaction with humans, remember, a decrease in coral cover as we see an increase in mean wave energy. We don't see so much of that going on at these populated islands. If we think about productivity, which came out of the model is also important, increased productivity, as we might expect, is correlated with an increased uh, coral cover. Again, at the remote islands, though, in black, we don't see this pattern. And this got us thinking, um, is there some kind of breakdown of uh, these populated islands in these sort of biophysical couplings, if you like? Do humans change the reef so much that it kind of alters the rules? And, and these climate variables don't, no longer apply. And this is kind of what got us thinking. For CCA, the patterns are easier to explain. We see this positive increase between irradiance anomalies and CCA cover. So in other words, islands that experience these pulses of irradiance, freak, freak irradiance anomalies, uh, get more CCA. They're, these things are photoadaptive, far more photoadaptive than corals are. This makes perfect sense. Light is their food, and as long as they can adapt to those high levels, they should grow faster. Um, again, both anomaly and anomaly magnitude were the optimal predictors of this benthic category, and we see the positive relationships in both. The interesting thing here is that these relationships are reminded of, of something else. We've been doing a higher resolution study at Kingman Reef in the Central Pacific, which is one of the most uh, remote reefs on the planet and has a huge array of reef habitats really, really high coral cover, really interesting place, and beautiful, as you can see. Uh, we actually created a higher resolution wave model just for Kingman around the island, and actually, if you plot, you look at the same sort of relationships, you see this decrease in higher coral cover with increasing wave power. The same pattern we saw across all 40 islands across the Pacific, which I think is really interesting. The other thing that the model reminded us of was a depth study we'd done at Kingman, looking at the uh, percent cover of CCA, that cross those coralline now, give it correlated with the radiance, and if you plot its percent cover with depth, in other words, a decrease in the radiance with depth, you see its cover decreasing. So some interesting patterns that appear to sort of scale across both in a single island and across all these islands, which I think is really, really cool. Okay, to summarize then, that was that sort of snapshot view of the reef. If we just take that one point in time and try to understand what may be structuring those patterns, which is a, a little bit of a simplistic view of how reefs actually work. Um, it appears that both local human impacts and these sort of regional scale gradients in physical forcing structure coral reefs. And this is important because it's not all humans, this is saying. If you go to some of these outer places in the Pacific where there aren't humans, there are other things governing who are, who are the people on the reef benthos. There's this hint, though, which I think is the most interesting thing, that populated islands, that this biophysical coupling maybe breaks down. And if you think about what humans do to reefs, they pollute them, they alter the species compositions. It may be that the rules have changed that much. That those species compositions are just sort of in this weird state. They're not necessarily moving. Uh, towards a specific attractor based on these climate forcings. They're just sort of doing their own thing. And we'll talk about that more in part two. Um, and lastly, some of these relationships at the regional scale, these large spatial scales, appear to mirror those that we're seeing on smaller spatial scales at single islands as well, which is ecologically quite interesting. Okay, so that was the snapshot. What's more interesting is that the NOAA toad uh, diver survey data actually started in the year 2000. So we have data from 2000 through to 2013 now, or 2012, excuse me. And so what's actually interesting to ask the question is how, do, uh, tem how does the temporal variation in the reef characteristics correlate with temporal variations in climate? And how is that then affected by people or no people at these islands? A challenging question, but was the original question uh, uh, posed to us? Just to remind you then, so the toad diver survey uh, is, is taken around the island. Uh, and is recording what, it, what he or she sees at set intervals, and each one of these intervals is then plotted as a point using a layback algorithm. Uh, you can then split the island up into these discrete sectors and plot these points so you have some kind of idea of discrete space with value, and then you can turn that into a graph. So you can basically stretch out the circumference of the island on the x-axis to be cell number, so zero through to 161, I believe, for Palmyra, and then you can plot the hard coral cover. In other words, the change in hard coral cover as you traverse the island. And if you do that through multiple points in time, something becomes clear, as you'll see. 
we start to build a picture of what's going on. But there are some serious challenges to this kind of data. Number one, the data are continuous-ish, you know, broadly speaking. And what that means for, uh, for any of you that are quantitatively savvy is that we're having to deal with spatial and temporal autocorrelation in these kind of data. Uh, uh, sometimes people just ignore autocorrelation. Um, you probably shouldn't, especially with this kind of data. It's also patchy. As you saw from the graph, there's patchy overlap through time. We don't have a, a, a benthic value for every single discrete cell for every single year. Sometimes through weather or BZ not pulling his weight, they didn't get around the entire island. And so we have patchy data. It's challenging. So how do we quantify spatial temporal change? Because these are the right data to ask that question, but we have to deal with some challenges. And this is what took us the best part of a year to actually think of an analytical routine uh, that could deal with this. Now, there are routines out there that will do little bits of what we wanted, but our lab is, a, is, is very much pushed towards trying to create sort of in-house working uh, algorithms and routines so we know exactly what's going on. I don't like the sort of black box ecologists pushing buttons until you get the right p-value. It kind of scares me. So we try to get into the inner workings of some of the math. And this is the only little bit I'm going to go into. Uh, but I, I spent the sort of first uh, year working on this routine, which I've called delineation transition analysis, or delta. For you math geeks, you'll see the joke. Um, it's an R package. If you use R, it's a freely on, uh, uh, available online uh, statistics program. And this package consists of, uh, of several base functions and these larger wrapper functions. Um, in summary, what the routine does is four main things. It, it identifies autocorrelation in spatially continuous data, spatial and temporal autocorrelation, using techniques that are already published. So I, did, I didn't come up with this myself, but building into a framework which I can manipulate. This is the part which we sort of worked on was a little bit more novel, and that's to actually, from this sigma of autocorrelation, start trying to define optimal spatial scales with, victory, with which to compare patterns both through space and time. And I'll just sort of leave it at that for now. An important part of this is also called phase, which physicists will be aware of, which is where once you have that signal, that signal can also be apparent in multiple spaces at the same time. So how do you come up with that optimal arrangement? In other words, if you define through autocorrelation your optimal sector size around that island with which to compare through time, there are multiple ways in which you can arrange those sectors. So how do you do that? And that's what phase gets at. And lastly, there's something called mathematical texture, which is basically change in any kind of signal through space and time. Mathematicians just like to call it texture. It's pretty awkward. Uh, that's essentially what delta is analyzing. It's looking for changes in mathematical texture through space and time, but accounting for autocorrelation, both spatially and temporal, in this, in, this, in this tricky data set. And it took us a while, but we got there. And so now we can actually ask the question, uh, using these data, how do, what is the spatial temporal change exhibited using these data? And, and, and just to point out, that although this is, was our sort of motivation was for toad diver survey data, this could apply, apply for anything, whether it was... Um, you know, a canopy cover around an island of coral, uh, around a mountain, sorry, of, cor of forest cover, anything that's continuous and spatial, bacterial numbers across an agar plate, I don't know, thing, anything. So we go back to our islands. I'm going to show you a little example of sort of delta in action. We're going to take an example, Wake Atoll in the Central Pacific, uh, which has no people there. I've chosen this to show you because it's actually a very small island, so the data we have from around the island is very, very continuous and, and pretty good through time. And just to show you, like, this is the, very, the most simplistic use of this routine, but what you can look at, again, we have our island circumference here. So wake is approximately 85 cells. But those cells are correlated, right? Now, if we just don't think about the correlation for the moment and just pool up all the different cell combinations we could have right up to the entire island, we can then plot what happens as you circumnavigate the island as a function of that cell size. And for this simplicity's sake, you can do this in a continual manner, but I've asked the routine just to tell us whether these uh, binary changes, where we have either the threshold of 10% change, either green being a, an increase of 10% coral cover. I'm only talking about coral cover from now on, sorry. No change, in other words, less than 10%, either positive or negative, or a reduction in coral cover of greater than 10%. And NA is where we just don't have matching data for those positions through those two year comparisons. Note that we're comparing 2005 to 2007 at this particular island. And what you can see when you analyze your optimal spatial scale, this is just kind of theoretical, I'm just sort of showing it as a cartoon here, you um, can then optimize it and then read across the circumference of your island to truly work out what that true change has been between those two years. Now that gives you actual spatial change, but you can also pull that up to an accurate island mean change through time as well. And that's exactly what's going on here. So what we can see going on with Wake, and this is real data, um, between 2005 and 2007, these red patches, remember the loss of coral cover, you see these parts of the island that, that were hit by something and the coral cover decreased. There's a blip of recovery being the green here between 2007 and 9. Between 2009 and 11, though, we see this large increase in what was this decrease previously. And this is what resilience is, if you like. This is, is the coral coming back. And we're starting to see the signal from these data now. 
Now, if you do this for every single island and you optimize it and you use delta to its full uh, potential, you can end up with your response variable, this looks familiar from earlier, being the change through time for each of these islands rather than the static snapshot. And you can then relate that to the change in our climate forcings through time. How do you do this? You, you can't, sadly can't do it using a generalized linear model. We wanted to move something a little bit more sophisticated. Uh, and and I, I kind of hate to talk about it because I realize that Bayesian modeling has just become so trendy. We didn't just use it so we could say Bayesian modeling. It actually has a function we wanted. And that's, uh, I was interested in actually trying to generate parameter estimates. It's to try and generate Every time one of these things happens, every time it gets really, really hot and Scott and I, or our skin falls off, what happens on the reef, right? Every time there's a big wave event that's unusual, that exceeds that climatological upper limit, what happens on the reef? If you ask that question then, using a, a sort of modeling approach, I won't go into the inner workings. Anyone who's interested in the sort of Bayesian modeling side of this, we can, happy to chat afterwards. But for now, I just kind of want to summarize the story. If you Look at an SST anomaly, a sea surface temperature anomaly, i.e. when it gets really hot, hotter than that reef normally gets. At islands with no people, you see a negative effect on the coral cover of that, of that anomaly, which makes sense. It's probably leading to things like coral bleaching events. At the populated islands, we couldn't find any evidence of this in the parameter estimates, which was strange. Because I was expecting these islands to be sort of worse, you know, they're so stressed out, they may be worsely affected. Irradiance, positive effect on the whole, on average, on coral cover, which is interesting. Irradiance generally feeds corals. Even if it's an anomalous event, I think that's, that's actually quite interesting. It doesn't necessarily lead to bleaching event at unpopulated islands. At the islands with people, again, we couldn't find any evidence for this sort of uh, relationship, these parameter estimates. Waves, we see a negative effect of these large storm activities on coral cover at the islands with no people. Again, you think you can see where the story is going. No evidence at the islands with people. And lastly, which I think is most interesting, an increase in productivity in oligotrophic conditions at islands with no people has a positive effect on coral cover, as we may expect from that snapshot view. At populated islands, it decreases coral cover. Our theory here is that these islands that are populated are receiving local nutrient pollution. So they're, although they're in oligo oligotrophic settings, local conditions perhaps polluting them to the point where the corals are stressed, and that increase in extra particulate matter and productivity isn't helping the corals. If anything, it may be helping the algae so much that their competitive ability of the corals is, is being lost to the algae. That's our theory. Obviously, this needs to be looked at in more detail. But again, we see this hint. And I, and I mean hint, because this model is, is in a, this paper's not in review. This is something I'm still working on. Um, there's a hint that local human impacts decouple, or in the case of ocean productivity, uh, alter these regional scale biophysical relationships. Now, this hasn't really been shown for coral reefs before, but it's been shown for other systems. And this is something that, when I took it to a terrestrial ecologist, kind of went, yeah, so what? Because I was like, wow, do you think you can send this to nature? He's like, no, mate, you can send it to Ranger Rick if you're lucky. You know? <laughs> Take the Bornean rainforest or the Amazon rainforest. Before we did anything to it, the El Nino events actually trigger reproduction in the trees. When we showed up and we fragmented the forest and we planted monoculture plantations, the El Ninos now lead to droughts, which cause a negative effect on those rainforests. The entire physical, biophysical relationship has been flipped by human activities. And there's a series of papers in Nature and Science showing this for both uh, rainforests mainly. So we need to look at this in more detail because I think this is really, really interesting for coral reefs. And we'll talk about how habitat fragmentation plays into coral reefs, hopefully, if we have time for part three. The last thing I wanted to get out there, because this is sort of the question we were charged with, <clears throat> not necessarily biophysical coupling, but what about resilience? What's the resilience of these ecosystems? Managers want to know, are coral reefs more resilient when you don't have people? Because one of the arguments is, and this came out sadly of the coral reef symposium, some uh, talks were taken out of contest and run with by the media of, well, climate change is gonna happen and climate change is killing corals, so there's nothing we can do. We can't halt climate change, it's too late. But evidence is now emerging, I would argue, and this is another data set that contributes to that, that if coral reefs are given a reprieve from those local impacts, those local human impacts. It may buffer them against these, these global impacts that we necessarily can't alter right now. I think it's wrong to dismiss that we can alter them at all. I think that's a rather uh, sad view of, of our world. Um, but when you look at the ability of these reefs to grow or decline, what we found is that on the whole, reg regardless that these reefs are being hit by anomalies, the populated islands over, these 12 year, over this 12-year period showed an average increase of 0.14%. Not a great increase. It's a yearly increase, by the way, per year. The populated islands, even though we couldn't find any of these relationships, so there's no clear evidence of them sort of being impacted by these anomalies, just show a, a general of uh, sorry, trend of decline throughout this time period. 
What this suggests to me is that reefs with a lot of coral, they fluctuate, they're dynamic environments, they're non-equilibrium systems. Coral reefs aren't equilibrium systems. They fluctuate in response to the environment, but they come back. If they're given a reprieve, they come back to their functioning state, i.e. they're resilient. If the rules have been altered, and these relationships no longer exist, and the reef is essentially rotting, and I do mean rotting at some of these places, the reefs are going away. Hopefully, if we keep resilient reefs, we can keep something that looks more like this versus this. Now, this is not a practical solution to the world's problems. We can't have every reef looking like Kingman and Palmyra with top predators everywhere. We still have to feed people. If you go to somebody in Fanning Island in the middle of the Pacific and say, well, actually, all you need to do is stop fishing, he's going to say, bugger off, mate. I've got to feed my family of 18. Who, what am I going to feed them on? You know? There has to be a balance between these two things, and that's our challenge as ecologists and environmentalists is to find, you know, and I'm, I'm saying this carefully, find how much pressure reefs can take, because we still need to use them, but we need to use them uh, uh, mindfully and, be, and, and have, a, you know, have stewardship of coral reefs, if you like. Okay, so to conclude parts uh, one and two, uh, there was a lot of slides and, and graphs. I just want you to take away four things from this story, okay? The first comes back to our title, a reef is not a reef is not a reef. Not all reefs are the same. Humans don't have the same impact on every single reef. Climate is also important. We can't ignore natural variation when we're thinking about these questions. We have, to, we have to think about it. Interestingly, we didn't go into this in the talk, but when you saw that, as you saw the islands changing through time, we were looking only at island mean changes in the model. But what's evident is the spatial autocorrelation in the benthic shifts through time. In other words, what I mean by that, islands don't just change in a homogenous fashion. They change in this kind of spatially patchy nature. And what I want to look at, which I think is interesting because there's a hint of it in this data, is that different stresses could result in different autocorrelation signatures. Temperature events, for example, which are, tend to affect the reef in a homogenous fashion because all the water heats up. You may expect a, more, uh, a less autocorrelated shift in the benthic structure. If you have a wave event, a storm, which hits a particular portion of the island, it can be very localized, and you may see a much more spatially autocorrelated change through time. I think it would be something interesting to test. We think there's uh, this evidence that local human impacts may decouple these regional scale biophysical relationships, which would be the first solid evidence for coral reefs uh, and, and sort of mirror those patterns found in the rainforest. There's also a context-specific capacity for recovery. Uh, we go back to our remote versus populated islands. They don't respond in the same way. There's evidence that, yes, indeed, unpopulated reefs are more resilient than populated reefs. They bounce back. That's not, our solution can't be to remove people from these reefs. We have to think about that very carefully. And I think it provides evidence for managers that if we tackle these local issues, we can maybe buffer against global climate change for coral reefs and give them a fighting chance at least. Okay, how are we doing on time? We good? Okay, so that was kind of summarizes the, uh, the first year that I was at Scripps. And um, that was the first year, and we're, we're preparing, the, there's a series of three manuscripts that we're preparing at the moment, or that are in review. The second year of my, of my postdoc, I kind of lost a little bit. I mean, it worked out in the end, but I took a bit of a gamble, and I was actually um, spent the entire year writing a grant, in a full year, in fact, just over a year, uh, with Stuart and a bunch of collaborators from Stanford, UCSB, uh, for the Moore Foundation. The nice thing about it was the Moore Foundation actually paid me to write the grant, which was very unusual. Uh, they were particularly interested in this topic of resilience. I was lucky enough to go on a, a donor trip to Palmyra with Gordon Moore, uh, and, you know, in between this fly fishing, we're trying to sort of prompt him that this is a really important issue. And he said, yeah, sure, you know, maybe we can come up with a little bit of cash to get you started on this project. So uh, it's by no means my effort. It's a huge collaborative effort. We have some money to start looking at uh, reef dynamics, taking this, these data and extending it further to look at it in more detail. Because what I've been talking about so far is very coarse descriptions of coral reefs. It's like coral going up or down. Any of you that ecologists know that corals are made up of communities of corals that change. There's probably something going on across those islands. We're not just seeing a decrease in coral. We're seeing a, a shift in the species assemblage, which is far more complicated than just predicting negative growth or negative, uh, sorry, growth or decline. So how do we get that starting to understand uh, large-scale data on the coral reefs, but at a high taxonomic resolution? We can't do it necessarily with snowboard data. We were challenged uh, by Nancy Knowlton to take the idea of a 50-hectare plot for forest monitoring and, and, and put it underwater. Okay, how do we do that? Our usual way of monitoring what goes on underwater, if you're not if you're familiar, is a quadrat about this big. Okay? And we have fantastic data describing reef patterns using an image that big. The problem is that, statistically speaking, you can never really extrapolate outside that view, number one. Number two, a lot of organisms on reefs are bigger than 0 0.6 meters squared. And some of the most charismatic corals can be three, four meters in diameter. 
So you're never truly seeing the entire circumference of one of those corals. And what that means is you can't infer dynamics through time because you can't see the entire border of the thing. It could be dying everywhere else, and you may think, oh, this coral's doing fine from this small view. And thirdly, people who had tried to tackle this issue for corals had sort of jumped a little bit high, and they'd gone straight to the sort of remote sensing world, which is really interesting, and, and sort of trying to remote sense the entire Great Barrier Reef and see if there's a way we can describe things through time using remote sensing across these large spatial scales. Again, where that fails is this loss of taxonomic resolution. So how do we kind of, we sort of realized there was this middle ground of not, you know, tens to hundreds of kilometers and not 0 0.6 meters squared, where maybe we, interesting dynamics are occurring. The sort of hundreds, tens to hundreds of square meters sort of area. And that's what we wanted to come up with and, and try to figure out. How can we do that on a coral reef underwater where you need scuba tanks and things like that to breathe? I started looking online and I Googled forest mosaics and that kind of stuff. And, and then I Googled reef mosaics and came across, it gave me a hit on the Residential School of Marine Atmospheric uh, Science at the University of Miami. So I went to their lab webpage, and a chap called Art Gleason uh, had, it turned out, solved this problem. And it just he hadn't written the papers yet. He was just finishing his postdoc. He'd spent five years of his PhD developing a camera system and algorithms, which I'll show you in a minute, that can take thousands of images of the reef floor and stitch them together. Now, these algorithms aren't like the sort of uh, the things you see on Google, which are these panoramic views, which look really pretty and seamless. Those actually lose ecological integrity because the images are blended in a way that the, there's, there's clone stamping and they're, they're distorted at the edges. We wanted images that had real ecological integrity and to capture the same image, images through time. So the system he has is this system where a diver basically swims across the reef. Let me show you this maybe. And it ha the person has two cameras. They're not stereo. One's on an 18 millimeter zoom and one's on a 55 millimeter zoom. You can see from here, what you're getting from here is this wide angle view of the reef and then a sort of zoomed in version of the reef. You see here the diver does a, uh, a, this sort of lawnmower pattern of the reef and what should work, as we got it to work earlier, is that through time these images are then blended together using this algorithm of sequential images. And this is really, really clever stuff. And this is image matching at an incredibly high accuracy. And this took uh, five years, but it's a job well done. And what this means is that we can go underwater. Data storage now is so cheap. We couldn't have done this project 10 years ago. I went to Palmyra recently, and in 10 days shot 950 gigabytes of images with these cameras. We can start composing these large-scale images, continuous images of the reef, which can take us back to basics a little bit, which I think is great. We can go back to some of the really old school ecology from the forest ecology literature and ask simple questions about spatial pattern that we couldn't ask on coral reefs until today. The, the other thing to note here is that the, the, the dual camera system was uh, uh, custom designed by both Arts Group and BZ had a, a large hand in implementing this as well. And this new project we're launching um, has given us enough funding to sort of up our numbers a little bit. And Johan here is the stripy Frenchman, is a new uh, postdoc in our lab who has been hired. He is a, a, a statistical and mathematical modeler, um, and Stuart and I really needed some backup, and he's far better than both of us at, at mathemat uh, mathematical modeling, so it's really nice to have him on board. And he's involved in this project on the spatial analysis part of this, helping us to try and work out what, what's going on in these reefs. Okay, so here's an example of one of these. Uh, this is Nuka Maroro uh, uh, Island in the Phoenix Islands, an unpopulated group of islands in the western central Pacific. This is a reasonably small plot that we have. Um, this is actually from our first test trip we did. 60 square meter plot, and you can see here, it's a really pretty picture of the reef. Um, six meters by 10 meters, so a lot bigger than 0 0.6 meters squared, but not really the 200, 600 square meters that we're actually gonna get to in a minute. What, what happens? Okay, well, Art does all this clever stuff and sends us an image like this. We now have a continuous view of the reef. The next part is just laborious. We do not have the technology as it stands right now to, to automate the digitization of these images. This basically involves me or eventually people we train up to draw around every single coral in red and all the macroalgae in green. And to emphasize that signal for sort of spatial analyses I can show you here, this is that same plot now just showing coral cover and macroalgae cover across that 60 square meter plot. This, if you zoom in and zoom in and zoom in and zoom in on your monitor, eventually becomes a series of little pixels. And each pixel can be given a number. This is what Johan's working on. Each pixel can be identified as being something, and also how close it is to something else in a certain direction. This looks kind of like the matrix. You end up with this pic. I, I, this could all be wrong. I have to just believe him there. But <laughs> you basically end up with this digital matrix. This matrix then, which is thousands and thousands of rows and columns, can be read into a statistical program, and, start, and then you can start to write algorithms to understand those patterns. This is exactly what we're working on. 
Here is a, just a, a, a simple use of the mosaic, if you like, but a, an interesting one, where we have our, our pattern in space, and we have the frequency of different sized coral colonies. Size class distributions of corals is, is a pretty classical technique to judge the state of a coral reef ecosystem. And if you transform it onto a log scale, um, you can start to look at these patterns within each of these plots. And there are predictable, we can make some predictions about how these patterns should shift depending on the types of gradients we're traversing, whether it's human impacts or ocean productivity, and I'll speak about that in just a moment. Note the large computing power for this stuff. Uh, even on a sort of the brand new MacBook Pro, I believe this takes, what, an hour, you run to run? Eighty million. Yeah. So so it's actually not that bad. And, and I guess uh, everything can be sped up with use of faster processes. This is only going to get faster and cheaper, hopefully. The data storage is certainly a challenge right now, but you know we're working on it. Something else we can look at: uh, um, asking some interesting questions, perhaps f to advise managers and monitoring schemes. For example, imagine that you this was your reef or a sample of your reef, and you were interested in how large an area do I need to survey to actually converge on the correct percentage cover estimate of hard corals? So these techniques can be used in certain locations to guide monitoring agencies uh, to the power required to test uh, changes through time, that kind of thing. It also just gives you a description, uh, which you can summarize in the sort of a classic variance to mean ratio of how the variance to mean ratio changes as you increase the spatial view of this particular landscape. And then we can start to make some predictions about how this may change depending on which gradient we're moving across. So for example, we spoke about human gradients perhaps changing this, uh, the coral communities. In my experience on coral reefs, when I go to more impacted places, I don't just see a loss of coral cover. I feel that it becomes more spatially patchy and it moves towards um, coral species that by definition don't get bigger than often about this. Not all corals just keep growing. They get the coriombose corals that are small, grow to about 20 centimeters, live for a bit and then die. And I think it'd be really interesting to start testing some of these spatial clustering and species composition patterns through time. And this is exactly what the project's getting at. And more importantly, it's getting at the, the benthic battles. That's the way I like to think about it. Why sometimes does a coral do okay, and sometimes it loses and a macroalgae grows over it? What is causing that? What are the neighbor-neighbor interactions that lead to those outcomes? And it's really hard. If we go out to a coral reef and just tag corals, it would take you, it, it, I think it's actually impossible. You'd have to be so lucky in the numbers that you are tagging but here we've effectively digitally tagged, I think it was 554 corals at stake, just in this one picture. And we have, we can create hundreds of these. So that's what we're doing. We're asking questions. And like I said, the, we, I don't really have much more preliminary data than that. But the, the analytical side of this has only been going for about the last three weeks since Johan arrived. Um, the data collection has been going on for about six months, piggybacking off little trips. I've been trying to put people aboard to capture these images. And we have a series of gradients that we've got these images from now, totaling in 12 islands. We have a, a very high resolution study at Palmyra of changes in the spatial organization of reefs across depth gradients in relation to some local oceanography. We're actually applying for some money to try and take this down further into the upper mesophotic zone, which I think would be really interesting. That's why we saw divers on rebreathers earlier. The second gradient is moving from these idea of places like Palmyra, where I did my PhD research, where we don't have people to these gradients of higher impact. And these are real mosaics from these places. This is Palmyra Atoll. And this is uh, Christmas Island, which is a, a really uh, impacted reef not far from Palmyra, in fact. So it spans that human gradient. I haven't digitized these yet. The, each one of these takes me about three days, and I didn't have quite, quite have time to do it before today. So I apologize. But you get the idea of the sort of questions we're asking. Lastly, which I'm really excited about, is a sort of outreach component to this project, <coughs> which is uh, putting this imagery online. I think what would be most exciting is if we can capture these images of coral reefs, we can invite anyone, whether it's a high-flying scientist in Oregon who just is a really great mathematical modeler and wants access to images of the reef, can go online and, and play with our images, through to kids who just care about coral reefs at some school in central Oxford, and maybe they just want to see and play around with how these patterns emerge. And part of the project is to build a, a simplified version of the benthic model that is actually a sort of online available version where you can alter parameters and, and play out reef trajectories. But I just wanted to show you one of the sort of outreach components we're aiming for, a little example. The, the website is by no means, this is very, very preliminary, but eventually what we envisage is having a system like this where we can have our mosaic, in this case it's that one from Christmas Island, um, where we see, you can see a little, in a minute it will appear, there's a little thumbnail. And remember thinking back to the camera system, we have the wide angle shots which are stitched together to form this image, but then there's that other camera shooting on a very high resolution that captures really, 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 so it's almost sub-centimeter, millimeter resolution of the reef floor. And what we can do is we can link the two. So you end up with this interactive image of the reef floor 
where you can then, if you're interested in a particular area, let's just zoom in and look at one of the corals, we can say, okay, we care about this opera over here. We want to look at it in some more detail. We can actually bring up those high resolution stills that then link to that image. And each one of these stills has, uh, it's really hard to see on here, but it has calibrated laser points. So we know that that's 15 centimeters, and we can ask specific questions about really, really high accurate uh, size class estimates of these organisms. So although we can do a lot of it from the modeling aspect, looking at the mosaics themselves, for people who are really interested in perhaps taxonomy or really detailed spatial pattern, there's also this functionality as well. So I, I hope you're excited too. I was hoping to sort of uh, pick people's brains because this is pretty new to coral reef dynamics, but um, it's, it's pretty traditional in more terrestrial systems and forest ecology. So if any of you are aware of, of similar work, I'd love to hear about it. And um, you know, we, we shouldn't be starting from scratch. I'm sure we can actually learn from previous work on this one. Um, with that, I'd like to wrap up. Uh, this is, you know, as I'm sure you can tell, a huge effort from a large number of people. Rusty Brainerd, who is the division chief at NOAA in Hawaii, who gave us access to all this data. People like BZ and Emily, who actually went out, I'm sorry, Emily, I forgot to put you on here. Um, there's the shout out, who actually collected these data. Uh, people like Art, who's been spending all his life working how you can stitch images together. Jamie Go for being an oceanographer. Uh, other, lots of other people for stimulating discussions. And, and key here is the um, National Science Foundation that funded my work initially looking at these data sets. And then now the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, specifically Gordon Moore, who's, um, uh, they're actually exclusively funding me now for the next uh, three years, I believe. So. Uh, yeah, so watch this space. I hope to come back perhaps in a couple of years and we'll have some interesting results from the reef mosaics to present. Um, I'll take questions. Yeah. Have you we have. We've definitely considered the ROV route, which has been used actually by Arts Group for some deep reef work. Uh, the problem they were finding, uh, uh, we haven't given up on it by any means, is the, the overlap you need to stitch the images together. You actually need that sort of double lawnmower pattern. Uh, and it's, it seems that it's really hard to control an ROV to that sort of level um, of accuracy. That's the sort of first point. The second point is that in speaking with people, there seems to be this tendency once you've put out the money for an ROV to go deeper, deeper. Um, which means that we lose this sort of 30-meter uh, to 70, 60-meter zone, which is sort of the zone we're trying to target with divers. But, but no, I think it's a great idea. I mean, in terms of uh, increasing the spatial knowledge, mm. the point here on the concept of the Uh-huh. Uh, that would give you spatial intelligence and conversion systems. I mean, it's kind of insane. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's a, there's a group at Scripps who are working. We're going to – we've sort of – I've made it seem like this is all working really well. We're still going through a lot of teething problems in terms of actually getting this to work underwater. And, and once we feel comfortable, we're actually hopefully going to team up. There's a, a group, of, an image analysis group at Scripps who are working on um, automated recognition. So that's one thing we definitely want to pursue, even if it's just a sort of border recognition. But they also, uh, they have uh, flowmetry cameras and they have something else, something to do with um, dissolved oxygen sensors as well that can actually take photographs that will show you oxygen boundary battles going on between corals and algae. And eventually, um, we want to try and start building all these things into the system. Uh, initially, I would love something that just gave you really high accurate bathymetry. Uh, just something we could attach to the frame that as you swam around, basically it created this, um, this view of how the reef was, was changing. And it can't sadly just be a really accurate depth device because you are maintaining a set position above the reef and above its topography. So if any of you know of anything like that, that's something I'd definitely be interested in pursuing. But no, it's a great idea. I think there's so much we can do, it's, uh, it's fascinating. Right, yeah, so the, yeah, the, the wide angle is almost sort of providing that base map, if you like. That, that's the camera's just having that wider field of view. The other camera is so constrained that um, as you swim around, you're not getting enough overlap. You actually need about 80 to 90% 90 overlap between every successive frame to be able to do this properly. Um, so what happens is the algorithms take those wide angle images, stitch them together, and then once it has that view of the reef, it looks for characteristic shapes, these shape recognition algorithms that go, okay, well, this coral looks very much like this coral from this high resolution still. I'm going to match it with that. And that's what all those little yellow dots are throughout the image. Those those match still references. And you can alter the resolution of those. So in theory, you should be able to click on any portion of that 
image and be able to bring up those original images that went into making that particular pixel. Does that help? Sure. There a lot of percent, <coughs> percent cover. Percent cover. So there's there's actually another part which I left out, which but we're, I'll go into now. It's great. Um, the initial. So they're, they're doing two things. They're being dragged behind a boat, and every 200, approximately every 250 meters, they're summarizing what they believe they've seen in sort of uh, percent cover bins. So have I seen between one to 10 percent coral, 10 to 20 percent? Actually, a slightly higher resolution than that. And they're jotting that down, which is what each of those points was. The sort of summary. They're writing it down. But BZ fortunately had the foresight to also attach a high resolution SLR camera to the bottom of all those towboards. They had no idea what they were gonna do with all those images right now. There's actually 750,000 of them. Uh, but now with a team of people, I think Noah are actually halfway through analyzing all those images. So we'll now have those same towed tracks with those same points, but with uh, higher taxonomic resolution. And that's something that actually Jamie, uh, Jamie, the oceanographer is actually doing his PhD and I'm sort of helping to advise him slightly in with. He's working with those data to try and match them to much higher resolution oceanographic conditions and ask the same questions, but at uh, uh, island scale, inter-island, you know, within island variation, which is really cool. So those are the two pieces of data. There's also a video camera, I believe, mounted on the front that are filming for large fish. Um, the two, the divers are actually towed in pairs. You couldn't see that from the image, but one's counting large body reef fish and one's doing the benthos. So it's actually a correlate, it's two pieces of data. That Can I just also say as a shout out that it turns out, I recalculated this, that the towed diver surveys of NOAA have towed now the equivalent of London to New York. <laughs> Linear distance, which is pretty impressive, I think a shout out. I was just gonna ask, the, the touring technology that you've been collecting other types of fish data, mm. this image is for those that were used, uh, this is for the IOE, contact areas and other stuff. Are there ways you can just incorporate that sort of data into the drilling trip with yeah. Ab absolutely. Uh, in two ways, really. We, we're working to validate the remote sense metrics. That's something I think is really important. Although the paper's been accepted, I feel that I feel confident in the data, the broad patterns, but I would like to see that done. And, and actually, NOAA does have a number of loggers for temperature and pH and those kind of things out at a lot of these islands. At a key set of islands, which are the islands Jamie's working on, they have very, very high uh, instrumentation for oceanography, chlorophyll, all that kind of stuff. And that's what he's working on is to try and understand at that higher resolution, the benthic fluctuations through time in relation to those changing climatic conditions uh, across um, a disturbance gradient, which will be key. Yep. We can certainly pull on that. We can certainly pull on the fish data as well. Uh, I haven't sort of tackled that. BZ has started to work out some of that, has published recently some of that for his PhD. Uh, we are planning on asking some really interesting questions with those fish data about um, distribution of fish in relation to physical drivers as well as people. So asking similar questions, but from a fish perspective, I think it'd be really cool. Yep. Yeah. Um, you put together that mosaic, are you using a program like Texas for your instance, or are you using something in development yeah. right now? Okay, well first of all, I didn't, I didn't design any, I just, I'm just the dive monkey that swims around the, the cameras, <laughs> A. So all the hard work has been done by Art Gleason. Um, I kind of get it. The, the, but it's, it's as I've explained it. I mean, there's, it's actually a, a custom program he's designed in MATLAB. It's not, you can't buy it yet. I think ultimately um, he and his collaborator are trying to make it into a program that you can buy. There is, as I understand, a little bit of dispute going on about, about that at the moment. Um, for now, it's, it's an in-house custom algorithm. All I can really tell you about it, I just sort of believe it, is that it works on this shape recognition. Apparently, if there are distinct shapes, which are key, those algorithms can pull out those distinct shapes, and then once you have that, you can sort of build from there, as it were. Uh, there's definitely some ghost images in there, though, which we have to go in and correct, yeah. So this is only in terms of Not in terms of the routine, yeah, but uh, we would strive to make it that. I mean, I guess um, Art's trying to keep himself employed at the moment, right, so. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think with the outreach, uh, the initially, I, I mean, I think the data should be going online as soon as we get it. I think that'd be fantastic result. Uh, in terms of the algorithm, I, I don't know yet. But he's um, very happy to collaborate. He's absolutely open to collaborations, yeah. And in fact, the, the, he's already getting busy, um, which is great. His, and he's a postdoc within Pam Reed's lab, and the lab itself is becoming busy. Yeah. Can you explain the process of the construction of the We are. I haven't, but uh, people at NOAA, so Ivor Williams, who's uh, the fish team lead at NOAA, is actually has a paper in review right now. And it turns out, I kind of left this out, but you pulled me up on it. 
divers are really, really, really good at observing and estimating coral cover. If you take an island from those visual estimates and compare it to the high resolution stills, the mean island difference is about 0.2%, which I think is phenomenal. Turns out it's not as straightforward for CCA and macroalgae. I feel confident in presenting those results because I feel that if there are inconsistencies, they're fairly comparable across those islands. Uh, but on the whole, divers tend to underestimate CCA and uh, underestimate macroalgae. Yeah. Yeah. But very slight, but yeah, they're really good at coral cover. 